Today we'll finish our talk about transformers. So last week we have learned how a transformer works. Uh, we have learned, uh, I think, a lot about the equivalent circuit diagram and uh, how to calculate the properties of uh, a transformer. Uh, I have finished with this picture showing different transformer types uh, from small transformers, which you see over here, that we can use for home appliances, for example, up to large power distribution transformers, which you have an example over here. Uh, the efficiency of a transformer is very high, and uh, it is getting bigger with bigger transformers. So uh, the goal is to make the transformer for as higher power as possible, and then you have high efficiency. If you have a small transformer for a home appliance, it may have low efficiency compared to the larger ones. Uh, but even in that case, it may be like 85% roughly. Uh, if you are going for large power distribution transformers like this one or this one, uh, then the efficiency may go up to 99%. And uh, in fact, the transformer is one of the most efficient devices in electronics. It's a non-rotating machine, so uh, we don't have any mechanical losses and therefore the efficiency is really high. Uh, today we'll be talking uh, mostly about transformer construction. So how is it made and what will you find inside? And uh, we will also discuss different types of transformers, such as uh, three-phase transformers, current transformers and so forth. So let's start with the transformer construction. Uh, the transformer is made from basically two components. Uh, one component is the winding, the coil, and uh, the other component is the magnetic circuit. Uh, the magnetic circuit is uh, made from a ferromagnetic material, typically electrical steel, and uh, the core of the transformer is laminated. What is the reason why we use lamination? It is directional flow, but that's not the main reason why we are using laminations. For directional flow, we could also use a solid piece of material. So let's say you could make the core by casting some piece of iron in the right shape. No, insulation is not the reason. The reason is losses. Uh, when we have been discussing ferromagnetic materials, I told you that we have several components in the loss in, in the magnetic circuit. Uh, one of the components is eddy currents. And eddy currents are limited by laminating the core. The reason is that here, if you look on this picture, uh, the magnetic flux if I look here or, or here, uh, the coil is here or in the center, and the magnetic flux is oriented in this way and in this way. So it means that the magnetic flux is in the plane of the picture, and eddy currents will be in the plane that is perpendicular to, to, this, to this sheet. So if we separate the material by thin sheets that are oriented like this, you see here the orientation, we limit the eddy current. So if you make the core laminated, you limit a significant portion of the losses that you have in the transformer. So this is an AC magnetic circuit. The magnetic flux is changing constantly. We have seen that it's a sinusoidal magnetic flux. And uh, by this approach, we can limit the eddy current losses. Uh, if you change the width of the steel, you can limit even more the eddy current losses. Uh, so we can make the steel very thin, and uh, this will provide you better efficiency. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you have really thin sheets, like a paper thick, then uh, it would be very difficult to manufacture transformers with this fragile material. So uh, it's a trade-off between thickness, uh, which would be really good if it's really thin, but uh, also uh, the problems during manufacturing. So the typical thickness 
uh, used for uh, electrical steel in transformers is uh, somewhere around 0 0.35 millimeters. You can have thicker sheets like 0 0.5 or you can have thinner sheets like 0 0.15, but uh, when it becomes uh, very thin, it's, it's really difficult to handle. Uh, the second component of the losses in a transformer is uh, hysteresis losses. Hysteresis losses are related to the area of uh, the hysteresis loop and uh, we can limit the hysteresis losses by the choice of material. And uh, uh, that's the reason why electrical steels, they have a relatively high amount of silicon because silicon increases the electrical resistance of the material without degrading too much the magnetic properties. So uh, in an electrical steel you find something around 3.5 up to 5% of silicon and uh, then when you measure the electrical resistance of this sheet it will be higher, significantly higher than if it would be pure iron. So uh, we try to limit the, the losses in this way as well. Uh, so this is the core of the transformer. You can see here that the core is split into several sections. And uh, the reason is, again, to allow us to manufacture the transformer uh, easily. Uh, so we have to manufacture separately the coil here that you see here and the core with within a different assembly line for example and then uh, it's assembled together of course if you uh, would build a transformer yourself you could make a solid core or laminated core from a single piece of steel and then you can uh, wind the winding manually but this would be very expensive if you want to produce like 100,000 of transformers so uh, transformers are built on cores that are having specific shapes. Uh, the shape that you see here is called EI lamination because the uh, shape is letter E and I. And uh, this type of lamination allows us to assemble the transformer at the end. So how is it, how is it made? You make the core of this transformer here, you make the coil on some holder, and then you put the coil in the middle and you close the magnetic circuit with the I section. In reality, it's a little bit more complicated because uh, you need to overlay different layers of uh, those sheets so that you don't have this gap here between the E and I section. So in reality, uh, you take the coil, you place one sheet of E section, one sheet of I section, and then the other part goes from the opposite direction. So the E letter goes from this, from the right, and the I letter goes from this side. I later, later have some, some video uh, that will show you how, how this works. So the goal is that we want to uh, minimize the magnetic resistance in the circuit because we want to have a large magnetic flux. But uh, if we would use this approach with a single air gap, uh, it would be too high. Uh, I have here some examples of uh, the sheets used for electric machines, not only transformers, but also motors. Uh, what you see here is for transformers. So you see here different sizes of the E section and here the I section. Uh, this is an insulation material that you put on the sides of the core. And those other sheets are for electric motors. So we'll discuss them uh, in, a, in a few lectures. Uh, in all cases, it's electrical steel. Uh, you see it looks like it's rusted but it's covered with an oxide layer and this further improves us the insulation between the sheets. If you want to improve the insulation even more, you can add, uh, for example, paper between the electrical steel or some other material like Kapton or Teflon. That depends on the temperature. 
but if you are adding more layers, uh, this will increase the size of the transformer. Uh, you can see here that we have different possibilities in lamination. So this is the most common one, the EI lamination, but you can find different types of laminations as well. Uh, I have here some example of a transformer. Uh, probably, probably we'll start with this one. Uh, this is the, the case where you have uh, the version, it's called EE lamination. So we have both letter E, the shape of the lamination, and uh, you can see it here at, at this edge. At this edge and on the second edge, uh, you can see the overlapping. So one sheet is longer than the other one. So the magnetic circuit is uh, overlapping. I'll maybe try to use this device if I find out how to operate it. Oh, it's going somewhere. Is it, yeah, it's, okay. let's see. Let's see if I'm able to use it. Okay, so I'm not sure if it will be visible here on this screen, but then I'll give it to you. So here in this in this position, you will see the, the individual sheets. Let me maybe just focus it a little bit. Let's put it closer. Well, that's the best I can do. So here in this central section, you can see that the sheet goes all the way here, and here the sheets are connected together and that they are overlapping like this. So one sheet is longer <laughs> than, than the other one. So the magnetic flux, what is it doing, in fact, is uh, going through the sheet, then, yeah? Yeah, okay. Can you zoom even more? Uh, uh, zoom, zoom it, and I'll try, to, I'll try to move it. I'm not sure if it would be too really visible, but... Uh, yes, yes, you see here that the sheet goes like this, and then it's interrupted, and there is another sheet that's shorter. And th the section that's right next to the first section is inversed. So here, this sheet is longer, and this sheet is shorter. So they are overlapping like this. So the magnetic flux, what is it doing? It's preferring the uh, way of least resistance. So if uh, it has the option, it will not go through the air gap, but will go through the connection between the sheets which are over overlaid like this. So in this way, uh, we are assembling the core. So for example, uh, this transformer is assembled in a way that you manufacture the coil on the holder, uh, and then you put it on some sheets, and then from top you, put, you start inserting the other sheets and you build the assembly. We'll see that uh, on, on the video shortly. It's not, it's not glued, it's just pressed together. Yes, exactly. You can see the construction uh, in, in a very... In You can see the construction in a very good way on, on those transformers. Uh, you press the sheets together with some mechanics. So in this, you see that it's just a screw and it's hold, holding tight with the screw. You can then insert it into some lacquer and protect it from moisture, uh, and it will hold even more than this, uh, this pieces together. Uh, this type, is uh, it's not visible what core that is. Um, no, it's not the, definitely not the L type because uh, here the, the core is in the middle. Uh, the, co the coil is in the middle, so it cannot be this. It is either this or this, but I'm not seeing the uh, the lamination. So maybe. 
Uh, it's somewhere in the middle. I, 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 I don't know. The, the, the what? JNC. No, it's just a manufacturer name. Uh, so uh, let's take a look on some videos how those transformers are made. I will first show you large transformers. You will see uh, the lamination part, and then we'll uh, look on uh, the winding part. Now you see the overlapping here. This sheet was longer in this direction, and this sheet has this shape, so it will overlap in this area. And the same will be true for all the other layers. Special stacking table is erected with a crane, and the core is prepared for assembly. Upper yoke is placed after Now it's compressed together with the upper plates. With glass fiber reinforcement bands, homogeneous press force is obtained. Okay, and now this will be the... Active parts in best transformers are... Winding part. Okay, um, I'm not sure if this is the drying part, but let's see. Well, we can watch the drying part as well.
weather in the coldest places on our planet, or under the merciless desert sun, power transformers are expected to operate reliably day in, day out. That's why they're literally built like a tank. However, such transformers consist of organic matter to a considerable degree. They are, therefore, prone to physical and chemical processes that lead to sustained aging and can seriously affect a transformer's life expectancy. The solid insulation, which is made of cellulose, is the most critical point. Moisture in transformer cellulose starts out low, but it accumulates over the years as moisture permeates into the cellulose from the external environment and the oil. This moisture, along with the high operating temperature of the transformer, degrades the cellulose, a process in which oxygen and acids are formed, which, in a vicious circle, accelerate even further degradation. The paper loses its tensile strength and becomes brittle. Degradation products are formed, among them carbon oxides, acids, furans, and even more water. The progressive degradation of the cellulose causes damage to the paper, and it reduces the dielectric strength of the solid insulation. The end of life of a power transformer is reached as soon as the insulation paper has lost 50% of its initial mechanical strength, a serious threat to costly transformer assets and the operability of entire grid sections. Siemens' unique high-quality Citram dry solution averts moisture accumulation and cellulose degradation constantly and efficiently. After installation, which can be performed without service interruption, Citram Dry constantly filters the water out of the oil. At the same time, moisture continuously diffuses from the wet insulating material into the dried oil, thus preventing further degradation of the solid insulation. This takes some time, but has decisive advantages over all conventional one-time methods like degassing and drying of the transformer. Without the application of Citram Dry, the water content within a transformer rises with increasing age and so does the transformer's failure probability. Timely and consistently applied, Citrum Dry reliably extends the lifetime of a transformer and increases the dielectric strength of the oil. Siemens Citrum Dry constantly keeps the moisture content of the transformer oil at a safely low level. This continuous process does not cause any downtime as is usually the case with other methods, like vacuum dehydration, which on top of that are significantly less effective. The filtered cartridges can easily be withdrawn and replaced once they've reached the end of their capacity. The ingenious Siemens Citrum Dry Stationary Transformer Drying System, which comes in a rugged and robust cabinet for extra protection, complete with a moisture monitoring module and an optional remote monitoring module is also available as a frame version without cabinet. Okay, well I don't think we need to listen to commercials, but uh, I would just show you more about the transformers. Uh, this is a video about electric transformers. We transformers. So this aluminium is the secondary winding, so the low voltage winding.
is hammered around the perimeter, and a grounding wire is bolted on. Then three thermoplastic bushings are inserted. Workers connect the low voltage lead to the thermoplastic bushings, then bolt the bushings to the tank. They adhere an oil filling guide to the side of the tank, then position an automated filling machine. A machine fills the tank with mineral oil, drawing a vacuum to make sure the oil disperses throughout the coil and core. The oil is used for its thermal and insulating properties. An internal fault detector will alert maintenance crews if there's a short circuit. A worker runs lead wire through the thermoplastic bushing and secures it in place. transformation, so to speak, is finished. Before transformers go into service, they have to undergo some truly electrifying tests. This equipment simulates a 145,000 volt lightning strike. Then it's into a water tank to test the transformer for leaks. If it passes muster, it could soon be appearing on a pole near you. Okay, so that's the process of manufacturing a transformer. The core is split into different sections. So for example, if uh, you have this type of core, you prepare this, then you put the coil on and then you close it with the sheets from the other side. Yes, you, you insert, you start with not all of the sheets that are together and then you put the coil and then from the other side you slide the other pieces of the material. That was the part where they were hammering the, the part. Or the second possibility is that you have uh, uh, the start with the coil and they had the, the, the C type of core and they were inserting the sheets from, this, from the sides. This was on the, la on the last video. Okay, so uh, now where can we find transformers? Of course, we can find them in uh, electric power distribution networks. So this is an example of a high power, high voltage transformer. Um, if you go to the link, you may find out the data, but this will be a few megawatt ampere, for example, uh, where it transforms the voltage from the generators to a higher voltage then it's transferred and then we have power stations with which transfer it back again. Uh, so the power network has 230 volts here, single phase or 400 volts, but the power distribution has um, typically 22 kilovolts. The reason is again losses. If you have lower current, you have lower losses. Uh, you can find transformers also in uh, virtually all home appliances uh, where it takes the power supply voltage from the power network and transforms it to a lower voltage that you use uh, for a computer or for a TV. Uh, what you see here is an example of a small transformer like this, which is in a small power supply. Uh, today, uh, many of the devices that you power uh, such uh, as uh, computers, for example, they have transformers as well, but this is not the transformer type that you see here. I'll be talking about it in a few minutes. So older power supplies used transformers, they looked like this, and then uh, you had the transformer, you had a rectifier, and you had some smoothing capacitor. So uh, at the output, you had a DC voltage that you used to power the device. Uh, the advantage of this is that it's really simple. You just have a transformer, you have four diodes and a capacitor, and, and that's it. Uh, the disadvantage, however, is that uh, the transformer has uh, a relatively low power density. It means that uh, if you want to transfer large power, the device will be very large. The reason is frequency. If uh, we are working directly with the 
50 Hz or 60 Hz frequency, then the transformer needs to be big. So in this arrangement, we have this full bridge rectifier uh, and then the smoothing capacitor and the output is some <coughs> DC voltage that looks like this. Uh, we have voltage ripple and we can limit the voltage ripple by uh, increasing the capacitor size here, but on the other hand, this will also increase the size of the, of the device. So today, uh, we are using free transformers for higher frequencies, at least in applications where uh, the size is important. And uh, we are using switching power supplies. We'll be talking about switching power supplies a little bit more during this class. But uh, in principle, the switching power supply is also typically using a transformer, but uh, with a significantly higher frequency. If you remember this equation from last week, we see that the induced voltage that we have on the winding depends on the frequency, number of turns and magnetic flux. Uh, the maximum magnetic flux is limited by the material, so we are limited to something like 1, 1 1.2, 2 Tesla maximum with today's material. So this is limited. Number of turns, it's limited as well because it is giving us what voltage we want to have. And the only factor, almost only factor, is that we can change the frequency. So if we make uh, a power supply which would use a transformer with significantly higher frequency, uh, we can decrease the size of the transformer. So in switching power supplies, uh, you use transformers as well, but they are this small. And the reason is that uh, we are using high frequencies. And high frequencies here means that we are using something like 100 kilohertz. Let's say between 10 and uh, 500 kilohertz. The larger uh, you have the frequency, the smaller the components can be, so you have smaller inductors and smaller capacitors. Uh, on the other hand, if you are increasing frequency, you are increasing switching losses in the semiconductor components. So uh, this uh, switching power supply does not run just by its own, as a transformer does, but you need to control the uh, transistors here that are providing the switching. So the transistor here is controlled with the controller system. You change the frequency and you adjust the switching in, in such a way that you have the desired voltage and current. And then uh, you have a rectifier. Typically, it's a, a one-way rectifier with one diode, and then you have a capacitor that smooths out this voltage. So this is typically used in uh, power supplies for PCs, in chargers, uh, virtually everywhere today uh, where you require high efficiency and small weight. On the other hand, it has negative effects as well on the power network because here this voltage is DC and if you want to obtain DC voltage, you basically use this diode rectifier so you take the power supply voltage from the power network, you rectify it, and you ch are charging a capacitor somewhere. And uh, this has the effect that the current that you take from the power network is not sinusoidal. So today, unfortunately, most of the loads that we have in the power network are taking non-sinusoidal currents, which has effect on uh, efficiency, and it has effects also on... Um, uh, on uh, electromagnetic interference. So uh, if you today look with an oscilloscope on voltage or current in, in the power network, it will most likely not be sinusoidal, especially in buildings like this, where you have uh, hundreds of computers. And this is an example of a PC power supply, which basically works in the same way. So what you see here are the inductors and uh, Somewhere on this heat sink, you will find those, those uh, transistors that provide the switching. Uh, the switching frequency in this case is uh, 
roughly around 100 kilohertz. Uh, the more modern components you use, the higher the switching frequency. So the components, they become larger, but uh, you are increasing the losses on the transistors. So you need to use different types of transistors. There is constant development of, the, of those components. So those are small appliances. Uh, for large appliances, uh, and for three-phase, we obviously have to work with a three-phase transformer. Uh, a three-phase transformer, you can imagine it like a three single-phase transformers that are in one device. In fact, you can connect three single-phase transformers and make them work as a three-phase device. But uh, we can save some material. If you look on this magnetic circuit, you see here that it has the same shape like we had for the uh, single-phase transformer. So this is the, the, the thing here. This was a single-phase transformer, and here we had a single coil. If you uh, work with the magnetic fluxes, you'll find out that it's possible to use exactly the same arrangement uh, in a three-phase transformer. So here is the magnetic core. Here you have uh, one winding and a secondary winding. And the reason why we can do this is that uh, in a three-phase system, uh, we have a phase shift of 120 degrees between the voltages. And uh, if you sum those voltages together, or, the, or those currents together, you will find out that the sum is zero. And this means that uh, you will have independent magnetic fluxes through the core, and uh, you don't need a larger piece of material. So uh, here you see an example of a three-phase transformer, uh, three windings for three phases, and here you see the magnetic core is uh, here. Again, it's laminated. Uh, you will see some examples of three-phase transformers in, uh, in the lab. They are typically, at, at least the ones we, we use, they are large, so they are really, would be very heavy to, to bring here, but you will have uh, some, some labs with uh, those transformers. Now, how can we connect the transformer? You can see here that we have six windings. Three are primary and three are secondary windings. That's the minimum number of uh, windings in a three-phase transformer. But there are different ways how we can connect them. Uh, the basic possibilities are that we can connect them in a star or a delta connection. A star connection means that uh, if you have three windings like this, you connect them all at a single point. It has a shape of star, you see here, so that's why it's called star connection. And here, this forms the neutral point. Again, uh, I'm summing three voltages with the same amplitude and with phase shift of 120 degrees, and the sum is zero. So here we will have the neutral point. Yes, yes. Uh, the second option is that you connect them in a delta connection. And in delta connection, uh, you connect two coils together like this. So this means that you do not have any common connection, any common point. Uh, and we can combine it. So for example, uh, we can connect the transformer on the primary side in a star connection and uh, we can connect that in the delta connection on the secondary side, or vice versa. So this depends on the properties that we require from the connection. Some connections, uh, they are good to suppress the third harmonic component, which is created by electric motors, for example. Uh, some are good for other reasons. So what you see here is uh, the star-star connection. That's just an example. And you see here that the primary winding is connected in a star connection, 
and the secondary winding is also in a star connection. So this is made as a three single phase transformers, but it's exactly the same thing like for three phase transformer. And you can see here that in this example, they are working with a 10 to 1 turn ratio. So uh, they are transforming the line to line voltage of 100 volts to a line to line voltage of 10 volts. This is just an example. You may use any other ratio that you require. Uh, in many applications, it is necessary to connect transformers in parallel. The reason for parallel connection of transformers is efficiency. Uh, if you use a trans well, transformer, let me go back to last week, where we have seen that uh, the efficiency of a transformer uh, depends basically on how much you load the transformer and that the efficiency is best around the nominal point. So if you do not load the transformer to a nominal point, it has very low efficiency. In other words, if uh, I have an example of uh, a power network, then if I have high load, I will need a large transformer, but if I do not take all the energy that I have ordered, I will have low efficiency. So in many cases, it is good to have two transformers in parallel. One transformer will be designed for <coughs> large loads, and I will use it in instance when I have large demands, and the other transformer is designed for small loads, let's say 20% of uh, the large transformer. So if the load in the power network is slow, I will use a small transformer. I will be near its nominal point, so I will have large efficiency. And if I need large power, I will switch over to the large transformer. And I am using it for large power, again, near the nominal point, so it will have large efficiency as well. So if we want to connect the transformers in parallel, we need to maintain some conditions. And when those conditions are maintained, we can connect them together. Uh, obviously, both transformers need to have the same input and output voltage. Let's say if it's transformer for, from 22 kilovolts to 400 volts, then I need the transformers to be designed both for the same voltages. That's, that's should definitely, that should be clear. Uh, the other condition is that the output voltage should have the same phase. And this is related to the way how you connect the transformers together. Note here that in this connection, or well not in this connection, but uh, for example, in this connection, this dot here, this marks the orientation of the coil in the connection. In other words, it marks the phase of the voltage. So here, in this example, you see that here we have some reference point, and then here this is connected other way around. So if we would measure the voltage here and here, we would see that they are not in phase. The same thing uh, can be done for all inductors. So even in connection like this, uh, you need to connect correctly the ends of the winding. And if you connect them in the opposite direction, it means that uh, you have a connection between those two voltages, which is definitely bad because it would be sh a short connection. So if you are connecting transformers in parallel, you need to make sure that the connected voltages have the same phase. And th the last condition is related to the behavior of the transformer in operation. And uh, this is expressed by the per unit voltage, which we have discussed last week. And the per unit voltage is basically saying us what is the voltage drop of uh, the transformer when I load it. So if you plot a chart like this, where this is current, and this is voltage on the transformer, you will see that 
when I am increasing the current, I am dropping the voltage. In other words, the higher the current I take from the transformer, the smaller the voltage. And if the transformers should work in parallel, this has to be the same for both transformers. So I need to load them both in the same way. I can't uh, use a transformer which has a different per, per unit voltage. A per unit voltage is basically saying us that, that both transformers have the same impedance and when I load them, uh, they will be behave in the same way. They will follow both this same curve and even if they do not provide the same current, then the voltage is the same. The reason is that uh, it's like if you have two batteries, you connect two batteries in parallel, and if they don't have the same voltage, there will be current flowing between those two batteries, which is definitely bad. And the same thing would happen also for the transformers. So the reason for this is that we have the same voltage on the transformer output, and there is no current flowing between them, the only current is going to the load. Any questions so far? Okay, so um, in the remaining time, we will discuss special types of transformers that you may encounter also in, in our labs. Uh, one of the <coughs> special transformers is called an auto-transformer. An auto-transformer means that you have just a single winding. So uh, you have one winding like this, the primary winding, and then the secondary winding is just the part of the primary winding. In other words, there is a direct connection between this primary terminal and between the secondary terminal. And the only way that separating them is this part of the winding. Now the advantage of this auto transformer is that you basically save one winding, you save the copper. So you have just one winding and you, don't, you are saving this part. On the other hand, very big disadvantage is that you have direct galvanic connection between those two terminals. Auto transformers are typically used to set the voltage. So we will use them in lab classes uh, to adjust the voltage that we want. Uh, it's very easily done with a transformer of this kind because when you move this connection you are basically changing the ratio between the number of turns. So here you have some turns on the secondary side and some turns on the primary side and if this is a slider then you can very easily vary the voltage. An auto transformer typically looks like this. It's a toroidal transformer. So uh, here you see the toroidal winding. The core is a ring, a toroid. And then uh, this is the handle. And when you move it, you are changing the ratio between number of turns. So an auto transformer is a device that allows you to change voltage very easily. The second type of transformer that I would like to discuss is a so-called current transformer. And a current transformer is a device that you use to measure AC current. It is a transformer because it has, again, two windings, primary and secondary. The primary winding is typically the wire or the conductor where you want to measure the current. So it can be some, some wire that is going to a machine or uh, you can use it uh, to measure current in the power network, for example. Uh, the advantage of the current transformer is that you are completely separated from eventual high voltages. So this primary current may be happening on a a high voltage line and here you can easily look uh, on the ampere meter you can work with this and you are not directly connected with this high voltage line how does it work it's work like a transformer so here this 
current in the primary winding, the, the wire, will create a magnetic field around it. So there will be a magnetic field around this wire. Here we put the core around the wire and we put a secondary winding, which is here. And uh, we are able to measure the induced voltage in uh, this secondary winding. It's a current transformer, so uh, we are looking for current in the secondary winding. So here there is an ampere meter. And note that here, this is basically a short connection. An ampere meter has a very low resistance, so there is a current flowing basically in the short connection. The ratio between number of turns on the primary and secondary side uh, can change the range. So for example, if I would double the number of turns here, I would double the current that, that is here in this uh, secondary winding. Uh, this works for AC voltages, obviously, only. It does not work for DC. So with a current transformer, you can measure only AC currents. Here on this picture, you see the current transformer. So then the, the wire goes through this, and you are picking up the, the magnetic field. Uh, in many cases, you can disassemble this core so that uh, it has at least two pieces. You disassemble it, you put the, current, the, the wire without interrupting it, and then you assemble back the core. So you don't need to interrupt the current. You don't need to install any ampere meters to, to work with the terminals. Uh, here are some examples of uh, current transformers in power distribution networks. So when you have overhead lines like this, you see those are current transformers. Uh, and then there is so some gauge that measures uh, what current is flowing in this high voltage line. And you don't need to be afraid it will not hurt anyone because it's not directly connected to the high voltage line. So example here, 132 kilovolt current transformer. This is the primary line and the insulator and you measure what is the current that flows. Uh, let me finish with some examples of uh, real transformers. So um, this is a large transformer. We've seen a similar one on the video, so for large power distribution networks. Uh, in the video, they were talking also about liquid-filled transformers. Uh, the liquid is oil. It's a mineral oil that uh, protects the winding against moist moisture, as we have seen. And uh, it also provides cooling, so it cools down the transformer. Uh, this is an example of a three-phase transformer. So you see here the connections. Here, a three-phase transformer in a tank with oil and uh, you see different devices like uh, like the the oil oil tank here and uh, different valves to release the gas and eventually to uh, decrease the humidity as we've seen on the video um, this is an example of uh, the liquid filled transformer relatively smaller one so few hundreds of kilovolt amperes, probably. Uh, this is an example of um, a really small transformer for home appliances. A single phase transformer, of course, uh, will have definitely lower efficiency than the larger transformers. And at the end, some toroidal transformers. So toroidal transformers, the, the ones you see here, are typically used for audio applications, for like for audio amplifiers. Uh, the advantage of uh, toroidal transformers is that uh, they have lower leakage flux, so they influence less all, all other devices. On the other hand, uh, they are more difficult to produce because here the core is solid and you need special 
machines to, to wind it. Basically, you start with a wire, you wrap it like this, and then you need to, to grab it from the other side and put it back and grab it again. So this is basically what the winding machine is doing. Uh, I'll try to find some video about this toroidal winding. Let me just see. So winding machine starts with the core, which is uh, which is here, and then they will insert the wire, and the machine basically grabs the wire from the other side uh, and moves it through it. It's insulated wire, yes. It's a. Uh, it's called enamel coated wire. It's insulated with a thin layer of lacquer. So that's a toroidal transformer. Um, I'd say better transformers, I would say, with lower leakage fluxes and lower influence to all other devices. OK, so now it's time for Moodle test. We'll finish a little bit earlier today. So it's called lecture test questions for lecture five. The session is started, so I can log in. Uh, I wanted to say, maybe you noted that on the, on the video, the core of a toroidal transformer is not laminated. It's not steel. Typical material is amorphous iron, which is like small grains that are sintered typically together. So it has better properties, uh, like for high frequency applications. In the toroidal one. Yes, the insula that was insulating the wire against the core to provide short connection. Mostly not, but it can be also. Typically, it's like Teflon or Kapton plastic. It actually depends on the temperatures where this should work. Uh, typically, electrical machines are designed for temperatures somewhere between 120 and 180 centigrades. Core temperature, a winding temperature. So, are you ready? <laughs> Lecture five, yes. Ready? Okay, so let me start it. No, 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 wait. Wait a few seconds. 
Uh huh. Yeah. What? If it would not be laminated. Mm, if you make a transformer from a single piece of steel, it would probably have better heat, better thermal conductivity, but it would have significantly larger losses. So, it will, it will, because if you make larger losses, you input large amount of power that you need to cool down. So it will increase the the temperature if you maintain cooling. So this is related to this question. The magnetic core of a transformer is made from electrical steel and it's laminated. You cannot make it from aluminium because it's not ferromagnetic. You cannot make it from copper for the same reason. And neodymium iron boron, that's the material used for permanent magnets. Okay, question two. Electrical lamin steel laminated, laminated, yeah. You need to read all the answers first. There, no, there's just one. If it circles, it means it's just one answer. Copper, copper in the transformer is the winding, and the reason why we use copper is that it has the best electrical conductivity, apart from uh, silver, which would be really expensive. Uh, so here, uh, the purpose of core laminations in a transformer is to decrease eddy current losses. Okay. Question three. Okay, so if you have an ideal transformer, the phase shift between voltage and current is determined only by the load impedance. <coughs> and last one. <coughs> now this one has multiple correct answers. Okay, so um, if you want to connect more transformers in parallel, you need to have the same input and output voltage. The output voltage needs to have the same phase, and you need to have the same per unit voltage. So there are three 
options here are three correct answers. Any questions? Okay, then, see you next week. <laughs>